Welcome to the Heal with Kelly podcast. I'm Kelly Noonan Gorse, and every week I speak to the leading doctors, healers, spiritual teachers, and scientists to find out what is truly possible when it comes to healing. I also interview real people with extraordinary healing stories. My philosophy is what's possible for one is possible for all. Thank you for joining me on this beautiful journey of remembering our divine nature and tapping into the truths that shall set us free. Hey, everybody, and welcome to the Heal with Kelly podcast. Uh, Welcome for the first time if you are joining us for the first time. And if you're a longtime listener, thank you for coming back. I'm so excited for today's episode. Like, I know I say that every time, but today, legitimately, I am so excited to have this conversation because... Dr. Katie Deming is here with me, the conscious oncologist, which in a nutshell is, you know, kind of the title of like why I did heal, really. It was it was kind of motivated by this story around cancer. And um, I'll just share a little bit about Dr. Deming and then we'll dive into it. Katie Deming is the conscious oncologist, as I just mentioned. She is a radiation oncologist. That is her history and background. She's also an inventor, which we'll get into, and TEDx speaker who is transcending the boundaries of conventional and integrative medicine to evolve the current paradigm of disease prevention, treatment, and healing. She blends conventional medicine with holistic practices and ancient wisdom to address the hidden roots of disease and activate the body's innate capability to heal. Welcome. Thank you, it's my pleasure to be here. Yay. So um, I think, it's probably a good foundation to start with how you went from traditional or conventional radiation oncology to becoming a conscious oncologist. Sure. So I was a radiation oncologist and healthcare leader within traditional Western medicine for like 20 years. And in 2020, I had what is known as a shared death experience, which A lot of people are familiar with a near-death experience, but a shared death experience is something that is uncommon, but when it happens, it most commonly happens to physicians, nurses, or emergency personnel who are at the scene when someone transitions. And so that happened to me in the fall of 2020, and much like a near-death experience, it changed everything for me and really changed the way that I saw what I was doing and also Western medicine. Wow, well, I guess the next question would be, (laughs) what was the shared death experience? I wanna know details. Sure, so I had just finished, I had, practiced as a radiation oncologist and then served as a healthcare leader for end-to-end cancer care, uh, really running everything from prevention, screening through treatment and um, diagnostics, and then into end of life or survivorship for the Northwestern um, region of the United States for one of the largest healthcare organizations. And in 2020, I'd been nominated to become the medical director nationally, where I would have been in charge of all of this for like 12 million Americans. And I had spent like five months interviewing and prepping and looking at the vision of what's possible for shifting really cancer care. And um, I ended up coming down to two of us and another woman got the job. And I knew when that happened, number one, I wasn't sure that I wanted to build something within the system. But then I knew when that happened that that happened for a reason that I didn't get it. And literally, it was within a couple weeks, I had this experience of the shared death experience. And what happened was my experience was different than a lot of people who theirs happens actually at the scene. So I was remote from the person who transitioned, but basically what happened was I was meditating and a woman's voice came in and she was saying to me, I can't let go, but it's not because of me, it's because of them. And because I've spent my whole career around death and um, dying because I came into oncology through hospice, and then my practice, about 40% of my practice was palliative, and I just really enjoyed being with people at the end of life, and so I tended to collect kind of this um, 
panel of patients that were going through this transition. And so I knew instinctively what she was talking about. I knew that she was dying, and I knew that she was talking about her friends or family, that she couldn't let go because of them, but that she felt like she was ready. And so I just started talking to her as if I was with her, like as if I was with a patient. And I told her that there's no rush, you'll know when it's time, and I'll stay with you. And it was really that simple, and I just sat with her in meditation, and I was probably in the meditation about 40 minutes, but what happened was at some point during the meditation, I saw who it was. Mm -hmm. And it was a woman, her name was Misty. She was in her early 30s and she was dying of breast cancer. And the reason why I was connected to her is because she was the best friend of one of my colleagues. And I had been helping my colleague care for Misty. Mm -hmm. So even though I had never met Misty, I was helping my friend or colleague make sure that her wishes were honored, that she could stay home, that she didn't have unnecessary treatments, and also coaching my colleague through losing a friend in her early 30s, which is just not something we're used to, right? Mm -hmm. So I was entangled with her in this way. And I saw during the meditation that it was her and so I just was with her. And at some point during the meditation, I started to feel her, what I could best describe as her soul, pulling away from her body. And as I felt that pulling, I started to hear pops, like I heard pop, 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 like strings popping. And as soon as the last string popped, I just all of a sudden was engulfed in the brightest light, you know, some people describe it as the sun. I don't know how to describe it with words, but basically like in this space of just complete light and love. And I didn't know what was happening, but she gasped and she was like, oh my gosh, it's so beautiful. And then she was like, I never had to worry. And she was gone within a second. And then I was in this space and I don't know how long I was there because time doesn't exist outside of this space. And so I was just there and just feeling this love and this light and this overwhelming joy that I had never experienced in this lifetime. And so I was there, I came out of it at some point, and then I was really confused because I was like, okay, what just happened? <laughs> I wasn't using drugs. I didn't, yeah, I had, I had no context. If you think about this, I was like a traditional third, 3D doctor. Like I literally was in the Western medical world and so I had no context for what had just happened. So I went to sleep that night and I didn't tell my husband because I was worried like he was gonna think that something was wrong with me. Like what is going on? So I went to sleep and then in the morning, when I woke up, I woke up to a text, and the text was from my colleague. And the text was, thank you for helping me support Misty. She died last night. Oh, my God. And I, at the moment, I couldn't tell her yet because I was still like, I thought, this is weird. Like, I don't know how to explain that this happened. I don't even know what to make of it. And I asked her, I said, I know this is a weird question, but I'm wondering if you can tell me what time she died. And it turns out that she died within minutes of me finishing that meditation. And now I know that that happened for a reason because if I hadn't gotten that confirmation the next day, I think I might have just blown it off or thought that didn't really happen. But because I had that confirmation, it was a way of saying, yeah, this is real, this really happened. And so that's the experience that happened. And just like people describe with a near death, it fundamentally shifted things for me. Like being exposed to that high frequency that's outside of this veil changed me, you know? And, it, and I can't say that I knew exactly what was wrong with medicine after that episode. I just knew that what we were doing was not right. Mm. So like I had this very clear conviction that the way that we're healing in Western medicine is not the way that the body heals and that I needed to leave. But <clears throat> I didn't know what was the answer. And so it you know, took me some time to kind of tease out and then also ended up getting a divorce because my husband didn't understand. Mm -hmm. He was like, 
why would you give up a career that you trained your whole life to do, right? So I didn't start, finish my training until I was 32. And he was like, why would you give that up? But it was one of those things where I'd spent so much time around death and spent so much time with people who are facing the end of their life that I knew what I was going to say at the end of my life. And that people say, I wish I had had the courage to just be true to me. And so I knew that I was going to regret if I didn't follow this. Mm. And so it started like the unraveling of my whole life is the best way I can describe it. Wow, and just divorce and also the fear of like investing so much time and stress and money and getting to the top level. I mean, the, the, you were top two people that they were choosing to run the whole thing. Wow. Um, okay, so how did how did knowing the right way to do things unfold like as like, yeah you know <clears throat> well and I think this is an important point for anyone who's going through an awakening and certainly you know people who are healing illness are also having their own awakening and one of the things that I think is really important is that oftentimes we don't know what the answer is mm -hmm. but it's very clear what isn't the answer and so the only thing that I could do was start to let go of the things that I knew were not right you know and that's what's scary I think that's what stops most of us right because here I was in a career I'd spent my whole life training for it it was lucrative my whole lifestyle was based on you know my career that if I let that go like what do you do with that right but I knew so basically I just started walking and the first thing that I did was start to study what makes us well because in medical school traditional western medicine we're trained all about pathophysiology so we're taught what's wrong with the body and how to give medications or in my case radiation to fix those things that have gone wrong but we're never taught what does an optimal human body look like? What does it mean to be well? And so that's where I started. I just started diving into what makes us well. And I started looking at all of the aspects of healing, you know, recognizing that healing means bringing wholeness back. And so looking at, you know, emotions and mental and spiritual in addition to the physical. And I started seeing all of this data that I was never taught as a medical student or as a resident about emotions and illness and healing and you know specifically like the ACE study, there's a clear correlation, this is the adverse childhood event study, showing that children who have higher numbers of trauma um, that uh, affect us emotionally as a child have a higher incidence of cancer, cardiovascular mm. disease, lung disease. And then also looking at the radical remission data of where Kelly Turner looks at the factors, like the 10 factors that are in common with people who have radical remissions and heal their cancer without traditional treatment, two of those have to do with emotions. So I started just putting together the pieces and realizing like any healing really requires this holistic approach and started putting the pieces together but ultimately what I see is that consciousness is the foundation of all healing and that like that experience that I had with my shared death experience was it elevated my consciousness because I was exposed to these very high frequencies and that we can help people raise their consciousness by doing practices that are physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual so that we can align and balance their body for it to do what it's going to naturally do, right? Our natural like birthright is to heal. Mm -hmm. But the problem is that our lifestyles have kind of inflamed us and prevented that from happening. Mm -hmm. So that's really kind of the journey that I've been on is coming to this place and that's why I call it conscious oncology is because not because I'm like more conscious like when people say the conscious oncologist I feel like that's somehow trying to say that I'm more conscious and that's not it at all can be further from the truth but it's more just that conscious oncology puts conscious at the foundation and the forefront of all healing and so what I'm helping clients do is regardless of what treatment they decide to do that's right for them because I don't like I don't have any feeling that 
you should do one thing or not do another. I think it's everyone's own personal journey, but that I come alongside and help you get your body aligned so that you're gonna get the best results with whatever you're doing. Mm -hmm. And that's really the foundation of the work that I do now. It's amazing. Um, I'd love for you, I know it's so hard because there's a thousand different formulas and causes of cancer and types of cancer. I'd love for you to maybe attempt to juxtapose what you were taught cancer was and then what you think cancer is now. Yeah, well, we're taught that cancer is a genetic condition, you know, that it's all related to DNA uh, mutations and whether that's inherited or from toxins in the environment. But one thing that was really clear in my career is that it's not inherited because breast cancer was my specialty when I was practicing Western medicine. I did breast and gynecologic cancers. And only five to 10% of breast cancers are related to a genetic mutation. 90% of the time I would say, I don't know, it's bad luck. Like there's no one thing that we can say. And so I knew that that wasn't right, but that's what we're taught is that cancer is a genetic condition and talking about like uh, nuclear DNA. But what I've learned is that I think there are a couple things. Number one, I think that cancer is our body speaking to us to say something is out of alignment, that cancer is like an invitation, whether or not you take that invitation to explore and see what's underneath it is I think the choice of the person. But I also think that our lifestyle has contributed to an imbalance in the body that is really based in metabolism. You know, and so Otto Warburg, the Warburg effect is that cancer is um, by definition producing more lactic acid in the presence of oxygen, which suggests that our cells are not using the healthy form of metabolism, which is oxidative phosphorylation, which requires mitochondria, and it's using fermentation, right? So when looking at that data, for me, that is very clear that diet plays a very important role in getting our body out of balance to allow this to happen. But I then I think there are all these other pieces that play into it, and so Otto Warburg based on all of his um, studies into cancer as a metabolic condition, really explained that cancer is a deficiency or dysfunction of the mitochondria. And I believe that that's true. And everything that I learn is just stacking on top of that. And so, you know, getting the physical practices, our diet and supplementation, getting your water right, and getting like the physical inputs to improve your mitochondrial health, I think is foundational for someone with cancer. But then there's these other pieces of like the emotions and our thoughts that also play into that. And so I think it's all playing a part, but I think our modern lifestyle has gotten us disconnected from nature. When we were living in connection with nature, where the sun determined our day-night cycles and we were connecting with the electrons in the earth, we didn't have the same level of cancer, right? So there's some foundational things about our lifestyle that I think we need to get right, you know? And it's more, less about fighting cancer and more about supporting our the health of the body. Because it's like, I see cancer as this way. It's like, if you have like one thief in the neighborhood, it's not a problem, right? Because like one thief you can manage in a whole neighborhood and you've got security and whatever. But if that thief goes and gets 300 of his friends and now they've taken over the neighborhood, the neighborhood doesn't have the resources to deal with these thieves. Mm -hmm. And cancer is the same way. So. We have cancer cells in our bodies all the time, you know, and our bodies just get rid of those cells. This is what a natural process for a healthy body does. But when we get out of balance and there's too many of these cells, then it shifts things in the body where the body can't take care of itself. Mm -hmm. And so I look at really how do we support the body and less about fighting and really killing cancer cells, even though I think there's a place for that. And I don't, I don't, I'm not opposed to it, but I also think that you can heal without doing that. Yeah, it's, I guess it's the terrain theory, right? It's creating an yes. environment within the body 
where, which is its natural environment, which is, you know, these cells exist, but the body knows what to do with them. Exactly. If we create a toxic environment in the body, then the cells go rogue and start to create communities and proliferate, and then it's too hot to handle. Um, I've heard you say in another podcast that all healing is spiritual healing. I've said that many times. I've, everything you've said, like our disconnection from nature is one of the reasons why society is so sick. Um, but the all, all healing is spiritual healing was kind of my conclusion after making Heal. And largely based on Anita Morjani's mm-hmm. shift in consciousness when her physical body was so far gone, there's not a human being on this planet that would think that she could heal. And she had a near-death experience, had a similar um, expansion to the oneness and the love and the light that you did. And then with that dissolution of fear, because she knew where the, her fear of death dissolved, mm-hmm. as I'm sure yours has, um, she came back into her body and it completely healed itself because that fear was removed. Maybe her frequency was higher. Um, what do you mean when you say all healing is spiritual healing? Yeah. Because I feel like, I mean, there's so much we could talk about, but I know there's people that come in and they do everything, you know, air quotes right, or they do accomplish a lot of healing, emotional healing, change their diet, do everything, and they still don't heal. They still pass away. Yeah. So I just love to like talk around that conversation. Yeah. Well, Anita's story, I think, is the perfect example that it's never too late to heal, yeah. right? So basically, her body was full of these lymphomatous tumors and her kidneys had shut down and by all purposes she died of her lymphoma but when she connected with her higher self and knew who she really was she realized you know she says something in there the moment that I realized I didn't need healing is when I healed Mm -hmm. you know and I think that that's connecting with our divine nature our wholeness is the healing that can happen naturally like there's a energy source that is just so powerful we can't even comprehend it you know and um so that is possible like it's never too late and i and i always say that to people and i have a client right now who was you know he was getting ready to have a surgery for pancreatic cancer and that when they went in, the they couldn't remove the tumor, and he was devastated afterwards. And um, I remember thinking, I'm like, this is absolutely happening for him. Like his body is protecting him. That somehow the surgery is not right. And as I've been working with him and watching him, I just talked to him the other day, and it's like that surrender to that anything is possible and that the healing is coming from something higher when you start to see it it's like this burning light inside that just starts to melt everything away and so it's interesting because i'm starting to see this in my practice so you had christy miller on the podcast and she had that experience after we had been working together and her point of where her consciousness really shifted was after a prolonged water fast but i think the the idea of I I truly believe that the healing comes from our divine nature and it's that connection. But what you said about so many people can do all the right things and still not heal their cancer, that it doesn't mean that they're not healed because who knows what their life contract is. Maybe they were meant to pass related to the cancer, but there was some healing that happened on a soul level before they transitioned. So I really believe that healing is not always about eradicating the cancer or prolonging your life because who knows why that person is here, right? But I do think that anyone can heal and it's never too late but most people don't because there's something that they're holding on to that they haven't seen yet with all of this, with their diagnosis. And when I say all healing is spiritual is that I think it's an invitation to look. What is, what is the lesson here? What is the piece that you are missing for 
your soul's evolution, right? And I think actually my experience of spending so much time around death has been really valuable in this shift in my work and it's also not an accident that I've spent so much time around death but um, we are here to learn lessons and grow and so cancer is like one of the ultimate lessons because it requires a surrender to the fear and I think that's the hardest part is because fear can contribute to illness and then having a cancer diagnosis like reinforces that fear at like the like umpteenth level like literally what could you imagine that would make you more fearful and so here it is that the invitation the opportunity for you is also presenting you with layers of more fear on top of it and so that is why like I use Anita Marjani as an example of like, here's what can happen when we connect with our higher self and our divineness, but you don't have to die to have that happen. And so I think a lot of it comes down to helping people start to clean out their body and also do the emotional work and the mental work to get neutral enough to see what's there. And once you can get neutral and really start to sit with it, I think that's where the healing opportunity comes from and and that's what I'm working with people to re to reverse engineer this idea of connecting with our divineness through clearing out their body, getting them clear. You know, I think of emotional trauma as like a backpack that we're all wearing and most of us have got boulders in our mm-hmm. backpack that we've just been like carrying around. Moldy boulders. Yeah. And so you know, helping people unpack that backpack, take out the stuff that's from the past trauma, and then teaching them how to be fluent with their emotions so that they're not adding more boulders. And the more you can lighten people, the more they become available to higher frequencies and then connecting with their higher self. And I I really think that our modern lifestyle disconnects us from our higher self. And that's not an accident. I think that, you know, all of that has been programmed in a way to keep people asleep but if you if you understand the inputs that we need and you start to walk through that I'm seeing it like I I'm seeing that this that people can do it but it requires a lot of work Mm -hmm. you know I think that's the thing and it also requires releasing the idea of doing it right there's no like right path on this. And this is one of the things where I think people torture themselves with cancer. They're like, I ate a cupcake yesterday or, you know, cause there's like the things that you want to do, you know, you want to eat right, you want to, but it's actually the way in which you're doing those mm-hmm. things. And so I encourage my clients to just like really be compassionate and kind with yourself and less about the details of what you're doing and more about the love with which you're taking care of yourself yeah. and embracing. Totally. Anita talks about that in her book, too. It's like once she came back and she, she she had lost a friend to cancer, you know, and had come at her cancer with every angle because she was Hindu. So she, you know, went the Ayurvedic route and she did all the ancient medicine stuff and that wasn't working. So then she went Western conventional um, and she was so fearful to eat any sugar because her friend had died. And then after she healed and came back into her body, had the shift in consciousness, no longer feared death realized that every the reason she got cancer is because she came she chose from fear throughout mm-hmm. her whole life now she enjoys whatever she wants whatever makes her body feel good it's a frequency thing it's a vibration mm-hmm. and that's like yes when you're on a healing path sometimes you need to have a little bit more rigidity mm-hmm. but rigidity and discipline not rigidity in mind and not fear right yeah and and knowing that you know energy and intelligence and this the fact that this consciousness is so much p- more powerful than us doing anything on the physical or the 3D, like with the shift in consciousness, so much is possible. Um, that's why like we bless our food because we can mm-hmm. literally shift the frequency and the ability for our bodies to you know, take in that nutrition. If we just bless it and we have that moment and that energetic shift of grace and gratitude, mm-hmm. it's wild. Um, when, but right before I did heal, I was just noticing like we just, it's just in our culture for 20 years now, maybe more, 30 years, but we equate cancer as a death sentence and that's what we need to shift. 
because that's why people get paralyzed with fear and just um, and then the Western conventional model is you get a diagnosis on Thursday and by Monday you're in treatment because it's big business and doctors want to give people relief in the only way they know how they've been taught um, so how do we and I, I had this vision of just like opening the aperture allowing us to breathe a little bit more between that time of getting the information of the diagnosis mm -hmm. and breathing so that we're not <coughs> constricted in fear and then vulnerable to being ripped down this big business pipeline. Um, how do you encourage or guide people through that window of getting the diagnosis and then having the space to breathe and really allowing your intuition to guide you the rest of the way. Mm -hmm. No, I'm so glad that you asked this because I think it's really important. And I'll speak from the other side because as a healthcare leader who was looking at all these timings, you know, we have all of these metrics about time from mammogram to biopsy, biopsy to surgery, surgery to chemo, you know, all these things that are metrics that the doctors actually, we think that we're doing a good job by making these things happen fast. But on the other side, now that I am working in this different way, I see the dangers of all of this and the that like pushing through so fast to make decisions is really problematic actually. And so the first thing that I do with people and one of the things that I do in consultation is helping people with treatment decisions and exactly what you described, opening the aperture, slowing things down and just saying, we're, let's understand what it is that you're dealing with what it is that these doctors are recommending, what are the potential benefits, what are the real side effects and the complications so you really understand those and what are the alternatives. And really, I think what's important is when you have a diagnosis like this, the first instinct is just to go and just do whatever because you just wanna alleviate the angst that it's creating inside you, right? And you also have these authorities, the doctor saying, this is what you need to do, right? And it's all in an algorithm, so it's just like very clear for them what you're supposed to be doing. And you could feel actually kind of bad if you don't wanna do that just based on the power dynamic. And so I think it's really important to slow it down understand like what I tell people is like if you're going to see a doctor you want to understand what are the benefits like if I don't do this what is the potential outcome if I do this what are they saying the benefit is going to be so you have those numbers and then what are the potential side effects and complications also with numbers so that you can understand that but then really sitting with how do I make this decision out from a grounded place mm -hmm of like, if I know I'm gonna be okay, and like I know that all of this is gonna work out, what decision would I make with this information? Mm -hmm. And really bringing people back to a place of feeling grounded within themselves, because most decisions are made out of a place of fear and not wanting to regret down the road. So many times people just say to me, well, my intuition is saying not to do it, but I'm afraid that if I don't do it and it comes back, then I'm gonna kick myself and my family's gonna be mad. And, and so that's when I say, okay, pump the brakes right there because you wanna make sure you're not doing something out of potential future regret because you're just making decisions not from a grounded place, it's really out of fear. And so, and also doing emotional work around making decisions is really helpful. So the technique that I use, which is Bruce Lipton talks about it a lot, which is Site K. Site K is one of the most effective tools that I use in my practice to help people get neutral around their decision for what to do with their cancer and then also releasing some of the trauma that's already occurred with the diagnosis or even before that so that you can lighten people and they're more grounded when they make the decision. So I have these conversations to let's slow everything down. Let's really focus on what's important to you, what are your values, what feels aligned for you and, and removing that fear and then doing some emotional work to help with that. Yeah, that's huge. Psych K. I've done, I've had a session. It's the P S Y C H dash K. 
can you just talk a little bit more about what that process is? Sure. So, so people, if yeah, it resonates, they can seek out a practitioner. Sure. So Site K is short for psychological kinesis. And basically, it's positioning your body in a way of activating both hemispheres of the brain. So it activates the corpus callosum, which connects the right and left hemisphere. And the power of that is that when we experience emotions, we tend to either go into our right brain and become overly emotional or feel like we're gonna lose control from the emotion. And this is typically more feminine, like a feminine response to emotions. Or we can go into the left brain, which is more of a masculine response of being logical and just like explaining it away or just shoving it down. And what Psych K does is the positioning creates a whole brain atmosphere where then you're able to experience the emotion with both sides of the brain activated. And when you do that, you actually see that emotions are not gonna take over and you don't have to explain them away, they're just a wave. And basically it's gonna come up, it'll crest if you're able to sit with it with both um, hemispheres activated, and then it'll come down and it'll neutralize. And so this is a technique of teaching people how to be with their emotions and process them in a healthy way so that they are not taken over by their emotions or shoving them down and getting them trapped in their body. So that's one part of it. The other thing that it does is that you can clear things from the subconscious mind mm -hmm. through um, Psych K. And so this is the trauma release work um, associated with it. And then the last piece is you can reprogram the subconscious mind. So it's really a subconscious modality. But what I love about it is not only are you helping release the past trauma, reprogram the subconscious mind, which are huge in healing, but then also giving someone a tool of how do I learn to be with my emotions? And I think that is one of the most important things for people who are experiencing cancer is it's hijacked their nervous system. And if you can give them techniques for being with themselves, it just becomes much more fluid and easy to make the best decisions and follow your intuition. I love it. I love it. Um, we all need those tools, cancer or not. <laughs> totally. No, I've done Psych K. Yeah. I did it for like a year while I was healing after le I left Western medicine in the summer of 2022, but didn't launch my practice until the fall of 2023. And I knew that it was really important for me to do my own healing if I was going to help other people heal so mm -hmm. that I wasn't bringing that baggage into my work. And so I know that it's really powerful that all of us could benefit from it. Yeah. I'm sure you'll do this in a conscious way, but I'm gonna ask it anyway because, I mean, I'm gonna ask it because you can deliver in a conscious way, but as people are listening, I'd love, you know, having experience on both sides of the coin, integrative or, you know, holistic oncology and conventional, what are the risks that or side effects or warnings that a lot of people don't really have time to absorb when they're get the diagnosis and then their doctors or their oncologists are recommending, you know, a course of chemo, radiation, surgery. Um, so they don't have time to research maybe the harm and the effects. Like I've heard that on the chemo bags, like they actually could cause cancer. Radiation mm -hmm. absolutely causes cancer. So for people listening that are hopefully not in that fear state, just to give education on the downsides of only going conventional, because I like Peter Crone, I think says it in the film, I forgot who says it in the heel, but it's like you could do conventional and, may, and maybe it works for different types of cancers, but if you don't change the terrain that allowed, you know, whether it's an emotional trauma, toxins in your environment, unhealthy relationship or abandoning yourself along your career path, any of these things creating um, the inflamed toxic terrain that allowed cancer to proliferate, if you don't change that terrain, then the cancer will come back and mm -hmm. perhaps with a vengeance because these side effects. So I'd love for just a little background education on those modalities um, or those therapeutics, just so people can, you know, they could still choose those as long as they're supporting their yeah. body in a holistic manner. I'd like to yeah. talk about that a little bit. Sure. Well, I think that 
the way that I've come to see chemotherapy and radiation for cancer is um, is different now that I've shifted into this new work. But cancer is an imbalance of increased toxicity in the body and decrease immune function and basically optimal cellular function is decreased. And so you've got this imbalance, right? And so the treatments that we give with radiation and chemotherapy, unfortunately, worsen that out of balance. So you're increasing toxicity, you're putting radiation or chemotherapy in the body, which is additional toxins, and you're lowering the immune system. And so when I first started the practice, I really thought that I was going to be supporting mostly people who were doing conventional therapy to get better results with that. But as I've gotten into my practice, I'm seeing the harms of what happens. And so I think that, I think there is um, value to some of these treatments, but if you're gonna do these treatments, you have to recognize what's happening. What is the toxic byproduct of using these treatments to kill cancer cells? And it's you're increasing toxicity in the body and then you're lowering your immune system. And one of the things that most people don't understand about these treatments in radiation and chemotherapy is that the way that they kill cancer cells is through logarithmic cell kill. And this is like antibacterials. You'll see on the bottle, it'll say, kills 99.9% of the bacteria, not 100%. And the reason why is because this is logarithmic cell kill and that you kill most of them, but then there's this tail where you still have in the case of antibacterial bacteria is still in place. But the same thing is true for cancer. And you can ask your medical oncologist, you can ask your radiation oncologist, and they will explain that this is true, is that the goal is to kill most of the cancer cells, but you're gonna leave some cells. And that cancer cells, it requires about a million cells to have a centimeter of disease. And if you look at a PET scan, you won't have a PET scan light up until you have a a centimeter of disease, which is a million cells. So you can reduce the cancer burden to 100 cells, 1,000, 100,000 cells, and not see it on scans, right? And the idea is, the reason why this is acceptable in Western medicine is because we'll say, well, then the immune system takes care of the rest because our bodies are designed to deal with the cancer cells, but The problem is is that if you were growing cancer before the treatment and now we've decreased your immune system and increased the toxicity, is your body really capable of doing that? And so what I would say is that if you're going to do conventional therapy, you want to have a plan to help you when it's finished decrease that toxicity, so basically detoxing your body and then building up your immune system and making sure you're getting the right inputs. And you can do this during treatment as well, but my experience is that most people are so tired and it's just really hard that oftentimes that deeper work of clearing out and boosting your system happens afterwards. Mm -hmm. So I always just tell people that if you're gonna do it, just know that this has an effect on your body and you're gonna wanna have a plan in place to deal with that and deal with the underlying causes so that you deal with the problem that caused the cancer in the first place. Mm I mean, that should just be part of the protocol, if you ask me, you know what I mean? But the problem is the doctors don't know. And this is where I have a lot of compassion because I was there, like just a couple of years ago, I didn't, I knew there was an emotional component to cancer, but I didn't know the data and the doctors aren't taught this. And this is, you know, I think what is sad is that we've taken these people who really went into medicine because they wanted to help people and they wanted to heal and we haven't given them the right education Mm -hmm. potentially because pharmaceutical companies fund higher education of doctors at this point in time i think immunotherapy's intention is to also like not take out the immune system or what is immunotherapy and how does it relate to those yeah. to radiation and So and I have to say that I'm not an expert in immunotherapy but immunotherapy is targeted therapy that targets specific um, receptors or you know immunological targets that are related to the cancer and the idea is that it's more targeted and less like 
traditional chemotherapy, cytotoxic chemotherapy is like poison. And the idea is that the cancer cells are dividing more rapidly because they're using fermentation and taking up sugar, that the cancer cells will take up more of the poison than the normal cells, right? So that's like normal cytotoxic chemotherapy. Immunotherapy is more targeted for specific targets within the cancer. And the idea is that you're lessening the toxicity of the treatment. And it also has an effect on the immune system. But I don't think that immunotherapy doesn't also diminish our immune system because you're giving medications that are interfering with the mechanism of the way the body works. And so um, I think that if someone hears immunotherapy and they think, oh, well, this is therapy that's gonna boost my immune system while doing the treatment, I don't think that that is the case. And I don't know of anyone who talks about this specifically, but immunotherapy is toxic as well. You know, there are side effects and it's hard on the body. And you definitely see that through the complications and side effects that come up with it. So I think the the same principles of what I described before about recovering and boosting your immune system is just as important after immunotherapy as it is after cytotoxic chemo. Thank you, so helpful. Before I get into prevention, uh, can you share a story that you've, I mean, your practice is so young. It's amazing what you've been yeah. able to do. Obviously, Christy is an astounding example of, you know, healing or turning around or um, from brain and breast. I mean, brain is one, like I would say lung, brain, pancreas are the three biggies. Mm-hmm. I would, you know, maybe I'm forgetting one, but can you share, I love to give people inspiring stories of hope when they're told that it's impossible to heal this type of cancer it's very unlikely can you share like one of your favorite stories of of someone you've helped to turn around one of those gnarly ones yeah so christy is a great example where christy came to me and she had been diagnosed with the brain guest as she calls it so she had had breast cancer and then um, now it had spread to her brain And she came to me when that was diagnosed. And she was already doing actually a lot. So she had been really working for over a year on a lot of these things that we're talking about. But when it came in the brain, you know, that's a different, like it takes it to a whole new level when you hear stage four breast cancer spread to the brain. And, um, but she's, she has such an incredible approach to the way that she thinks about, and I love that she doesn't even use the word cancer and she talks about the brain guest and the breast guest. But um, with her, we ended up really looking at kind of all the things that she was already doing and then doing some shifts and, and going deeper into some of the emotional work. And then the water fasting was something that came up for her as a way to really reset her body and give this, um, you know, her body a chance to clear the cancer cells herself. And so she had radio surgery, which is basically very focused radiation into that one uh, brain gas that she had. And with radio surgery, usually when you have radio surgery, the first scan at three months after will actually show that it's bigger. And it basically is like bigger, but it's like a little bit um, less contrast enhancement. And then at six months, it should be the same size as it was when you first treated it, but less enhancing. And then years out, you'll see that there's still something there. So it's not intended to get rid of everything in that location in the brain. Um, and so like there, you know, if you look at like the Mayo Clinic, they have like these little images of what it should look like at three, six, you know, a year, years down the road afterwards. And so, you know, that's kind of what I expected her scans to look like, but she had the radio surgery and then we did this prolonged water fast and she ended up going thir- 17 days. We initially talked about doing 30 days, but she had travel planned. And so we just decided to do 17 and What was so interesting is that she already had been shifting from a conscious level, like that she's just approaching her illness as like this real invitation to uncover what's there for her. And so in this water fast, the water fast was profound on a physical level, but it actually was almost 
it, not almost, it was a spiritual um, event for her where when I first suggested it, she was so defeated because she had been sick, she had co- like she she just basically had gone to these conferences and gotten sick and and then I brought up the water fast and she said, "Yeah, but like I'm sick and and I might have covid and you know all this from just being on this uh she had been, you know, going to these conferences and stuff and I said, "Well, I said the water fast actually if you're sick, sick is probably a good idea because that's just going to help whatever you're going through to get over it." And she was really defeated when I suggested it. But then once she decided, she was like in. And then she was just amazing. And now in retrospect, she's like, I wish I took a journal. But what was beautiful is that I told her, and this is one of the things with my clients, is like when I dive into something like that with them, like with the the water fast, it was like I was texting with her every day and she was giving me updates. So I was seeing, even though she wasn't journaling, I was seeing the things that was happening for her. And by the time she hit the 17 days, she was like, I am unstoppable. Mm -hmm. If I can do that, I can do literally anything. And she's like, this cancer is gone. And she just had this conviction that I had full body chills. And I was like, you know what? When she gets that scan, I don't know what it's going to show, but something really incredible has just happened for her. And so sure enough, she had the scan. And the scan literally shows nothing inside her brain, nothing. Not even what you would expect to see years mm-hmm. down the road. It is completely clear. And it was funny because when she saw her neurosurgeon, the neurosurgeon was like, it's not there. And she was like, I know that's good, but I don't know, like, why is he saying, like, why is he surprised that it's yeah. like not there? And so then when she finally was able to get me the images, I was like, no, Chris, you don't understand. This is not normal. Like, this is not an expected result. This is what I would consider a radical remission because it literally looks like you never had any cancer in the brain, mm. which just doesn't happen. Because even if there wasn't residual tumor, there should be dead tissue in there. Necrosis is a very common finding after radi- like high dose radiation to the brain. And she had no necrosis, no evidence of tumor, mm-hmm. and just gone. And the other thing that opened for her that I think is also important is that healing and our dharma or why we're here, I believe are connected. And when Anita talks about that as well, like remember your mission, like cancer mm. is an invitation to remember why you came. Your mission is Rem- remember my mission. Yes, yeah. exactly. And um, that is one thing that opened for Christy. When she healed, she also saw what she was supposed to be doing, which is the mindset coaching, which she's so brilliant at, mm. right? But she wasn't focused in that area. And so that was another piece that I knew when she found that in addition to the scan that this was like really something remarkable had happened of her connecting with her higher self. So I've only, you know, my practice, I started in October. So Christy was the first one that I saw that where it was like just very clearly something different is happening here. And Kelly Turner talks about it in Radical Remission too, how like fasting would seem counterintuitive to going through chemo or because they're just like, get as many calories in, don't lose weight. But every, you know, mammal or probably animal in nature, when they're sick or injured, they stop eating so that the body takes that energy reserve that we take for digesting food and all of those extra resources go into the immune system to bump it into hyperdrive and, and really clean up anything that needs cleaning up. So obviously, if you're going to do a fast, you need to do it under medical supervision. Yeah, it needs to be supervised. You were guiding her the way, you know, working her through all the challenges. Um, 17 is crazy hard. But again, it just to me proves that when you get out of its way and, and learn to support the body, it will do miraculous things. And that's what it's designed to do. Um, I love remember my mission and just remission and remember. And it's like remembering our divinity, remembering our mission. And so much of the trauma, the emotional suppression is like, especially with women and breast cancer, I've heard this correlation. You know, we, we suck, we, stuff down our own needs and desires mm-hmm. to take care of our family. Um, so we're nurturing others and then the cancer shows up in our memories. Like, so we're, you know, we're over nurturing others and, and abandoning ourselves. Mm-hmm. And Jeffrey Thompson talks about in Heal where, you know, there comes a fork in the road in life where you can turn left and follow your dreams and desires, turn right, you know, the direction doesn't matter, but go one route um, where the pressure of society and your mm-hmm. elders 
think that you should go or whatever. Um, and if if you take that road that's not following your heart, that's the moment disease begins. And so remission is like, re, like it's realigning with your mission. I mm-hmm. love that. And Christy told me like she was walking on the beach one day like early on in her diagnosis and she just got this download like cancer is a gift. And then she like went online to get the URL and that's going to be her book. And everyone I've spoken to that is healed from cancer when they were told they were not probably not going to, um, none of them would change a thing. They would even even though treatment was brutal, the fear was brutal, the you know kind of dissolution of their life was brutal. They wouldn't change a thing because it is on the other side. It's the greatest gift that they've ever experienced. So I just think if we can remember that at the beginning, and then you know have people like you to guide us through. Yeah, well, and so I had powerful. dinner with Christy last night, and she said that. She said, I wouldn't change a thing. It was so hard, and yet the most profound experience that has shaped who I am today. And I think that, um, I think it's holding this idea of it's it's hard, and this is a challenge, but the things that grow and stretch us and change us for the better often are painful, right? And so both of those things can be true. Like, I don't want to minimize that, like, cancer is some amazing experience that it is. Like, it is if you dive into it and embrace the um, what's coming to you through it, I think it can be so beautiful. But not to minimize that to walk through it is really, really it's hard. Tired, yeah. yeah, and to be really compassionate with yourself and kind to recognize that someday I may look back at this and be really grateful for it but today it's hard yeah and I need support and you know I think that what you described about breast cancer is absolutely true is that most of the people that I cared for in my conventional practice they were absolutely the ones taking care of everyone else and I think that's part of the invitation to stop and recognize if I don't fill myself up I basically have nothing to give and by the way it's hurting me because I've depleted myself Mm -hmm. and my mentor always says he says Katie if I don't have 50 if I don't have a dollar in my pocket do you think I can give you 50 cents and the answer is no he said I can only give you 50 cents if I have a dollar in my pocket first and I'm only gonna give you 50 cents because if I give you more, then I won't have enough. And so this is something that I really encourage my clients to practice and I also practice myself is that you have to, it's not like a selfish or, you know, like privilege to just, it's, it's a priority. You have to make this change. Like the healing comes from changing and showing up differently and doing something different. If you want to get the same result, do the same thing. Mm. If you want to get something different, you're going to have to make some uncomfortable choices. Mm-hmm. And that means putting your health and well being first so that you can have something to give. Mm-hmm. But most women with breast cancer, I do think that they're depleted. They've just been giving, giving, giving. And then their body's saying, hey, you gotta pay attention, you know? It's like, it's a message that there's something deeper that needs attention. Yeah, symptoms are feedback. Exactly. It's the language of the body. We need to, we all need to learn symptom language in in school, you know? Yeah. Symptom-ish. Prevention, for those of us out there that maybe lost someone in our family close to cancer or have this like little naggling, niggling fear in our head that like, one day um, it could be us, how do we not have that future? How do we prevent cancer? Yeah, well I think the first thing is connecting with nature and the way that we live and looking at the modern lifestyle is really the reason why we're sick and so starting to take, take stock of, okay, what are the things in my life that are disconnecting me from the way my body is designed to function so making sure you're getting sunlight you know and all the rays of the sun so going out and getting early morning sunlight for the red light and also in the evening getting out in midday for vitamin d 
grounding in the earth. These are very simple things that we have just lost touch, right? And we are living connected to our computers and working at night, eating at night, eating all these, you know, the wrong kind of things for our body that are convenient. So I think it comes back to looking at the way we used to live and not saying that you need to go live outside and like, you know, sleep on the ground, but it's like, if you're gonna live in a house, recognizing that I'm disconnected from my natural environment and what my body and my mitochondria need. So, you know, adjusting and doing those things, getting out and getting sunlight, grounding with the earth or using a grounding pad, you know, on your mattress to sleep, you know, getting those inputs, eating whole foods, you know, looking at the sugars, you know, there's just so much in inflammation caused by sugars and processed foods. So, you know, eating a balanced diet, I think most people know that, but it's like, you know, um, really being thoughtful about making small changes. And the other thing is, is that this is something that over the past couple of years, I've really worked on in my own life, because now as I've become aware of all this, I'm like, okay, well, I don't want to get cancer, you know? And actually my mentor said to me, when I went through, you know, in 2022, I went through divorce, had to sell everything so that I would have like a nest egg. My mom died of cancer. You know, I wow. left my career of 20 years. And he was like, look, he's like, I'm not saying you're going to get cancer, but like this is a perfect setup to get cancer. And so you need to be very intentional about how you're living. And so for me, it can be very overwhelming. And I think when someone's diagnosed, they're ready to throw everything out and like, you know, get all new products and stuff. But someone who's looking at prevention, they're not motivated in the same way. And so for me, I'm like, okay, how can I do better today than I did yesterday? And just making small changes, like looking at the way you're eating, looking at, you know, your day night cycles, looking at what emotionally you know, things can I work on to lighten my load? And just, but making it not like some burden, but just more like, okay, I'm gonna shift these things and progress over perfection just a little bit at a time. And even if someone has cancer, I think actually that's a good approach. And not to feel like if I don't change everything, I'm just making myself sicker. It's like, no, you, you learn something today and you're gonna do better, and then you're gonna do better tomorrow. And then it gets easier. It kind of builds, the lifestyle mm -hmm. bids on itself. But if you think you have to change everything at once, it's overwhelming. Yeah. Yeah, and as you make these small changes and then you start to feel better and then your intuition works a little stronger and then you're clearer and then you tap into new. So it does, it's like you just, that well, baby steps. That's actually really important. And that is why for me and my practice, I have kind of these six pillars is because if you start doing these little shifts, you do become clearer. You become clearer channel for higher level information from a higher level of consciousness. And so the physical practices and the emotional work all tie together with the spiritual work because you're starting to open and have less fear blocking you from who you really are. So you're absolutely right that the physical stuff leads to more awareness and more connection with divine guidance. Mm, less interference. Wow, that's good. Yeah. Um, so cool, what are the six pillars? So diet and supplementation, water, um, physical practices, which include like grounding, sunlight, uh, sauna, detoxification, um, emotional work, the power of mind, and then spiritual practices. So really like the four, you know, it's like emotions, physical, mental, and spiritual, but the physical I've broken down into water, diet, and physical practices because it's so big. There's yeah. just such, so Movement. many things in there. Yeah. yeah. Um, turbo cancers. Do we, are you seeing, you know, a pop-up of cancers that are uncharacteristic or obviously more and more people are getting cancer. People could have, you know, fear, theorize on why that is some people say it's the vaccines effect on our immune system some people say it's the tail end of covid messing with our immune system some people say it's just us being locked down and the stress and the, the nervous system and makes us more susceptible and it's completely screwed up so it could be one of those things it could be all three of those things it could be none of those things but i do notice that cancer is on the rise and younger and younger healthy people what are you noticing about turbo cancers and will they respond to your approach in the same way, do you think? 
Yeah, well, so turbo cancers are new, right? So this is new, we haven't seen those before and it's definitely on the rise. And I think it fits with this whole idea of cancer's imbalance of increased toxicity and lowered immune function and for all the reasons that you just described. So the vaccine is potentially increasing toxicity in the body and then the experience of lockdown. And that was one of the things when 2020 happened you know, I remember in March just thinking, oh my goodness, like the things that they're telling people to do is like wrong. Like to actually heal the body, you wanna connect with other people and you you Breathe don't want, air. exactly. Yeah. I was so, I, I was so confused and actually working in an oncology clinic during all of that, we never got to go home. Like everyone else like was, you know, working from home and doing televisits and stuff and we were giving radiation and actually it was very scary because we didn't know. Like there yeah. was just a complete void of information. But I did, did know that I was like, these things that were we're telling people to do are not right like this is actually going to hinder their ability to heal if they do get sick and so I think for all of those reasons you know it makes sense that if cancer is this imbalance of toxicity increased toxicity and lowered immune function that the turbo cancers are related to all of those things right but I think that it is all the same so I don't and this is one of the things that I think is another fear like they were like, oh, well, turbo cancers know, now. And so now you word, can't, yeah. right. And so it's like, no, okay, so these are cancers that probably now people have increased toxicity for whatever reasons, you know, and um, that it's the same. We need to balance the body. We need to detoxify. And this is the thing is that I don't even think healing cancer is different than healing anything else. Mm -hmm. I think it's all the same, right? And so I definitely... I see the fear raising about turbo cancers. And the, the one thing that I would say for people is don't buy into that. Yes, there are these cancers that we haven't seen before because we've introduced toxicity into the population in a way that we haven't seen before, but the principles are still the same. The body is miraculous. Mm -hmm. The body, like Anita is an example, it, it's never too late. It's never too aggressive. And, but it's, if you think that it is, if you really buy into this story of these turbo cancers are really different, then maybe it's not possible. So from my perspective, I see it as a you know continuum, but within the continuum of cancer anyway, there are definitely cancers that are you know faster, more aggressive, and slower. But one of the interesting things is that when someone has an aggressive cancer, actually sometimes the potential to have better outcomes is associated with that because there's more of this like break and crack in the facade that someone who, and I see this in my practice, someone who has stage four cancer or an aggressive cancer is really like, I'm gonna do it. I'm yeah. here, I'm ready, I'm gonna I'm do it. to do anything, anything. and everything mm. and yesterday. Yeah. Exactly. So I think that there's opportunity in that um, to do miraculous things when your back's against the wall. And death is our greatest advisor. And sometimes being pushed up against that is where the true miracle opportunities are you know, available more easily. Mm -hmm. And I think there's like, um, the word crisis, so I think of cancer as a crisis, but the word crisis is two symbols in Chinese. The first symbol is danger, which makes sense, and the second symbol is opportunity. And so it's looking for that opportunity of what is here for me. And I think regardless of what your experiences, whatever you're facing, but looking at like, what about this? Like, what can I use to really push myself to change and transform to create something new? Mm -hmm. And when you have something that's really aggressive, you can use that, you know? And in the Tao Te Ching, one of the quotes in there is the master uses everything. And so I encourage people like, whatever's in front of you, use it to grow, use it to deepen your faith and your, you know, belief in what's possible. Yeah, I just right before this had a meeting um, with my dear friend who's like one of the top teachers at Kabbalah, the Kabbalah Center, and he's amazing and he always checks in when he comes to LA because he lives in New York. And I just love our conversations because he just brings me like the weekly teaching. And so I was kind of talking to him a little bit about what I, some things I'm going through. And he said, you know, the creator created you know, they, they called the, and I'm gonna butcher this, I'm not a Kabbalah it's master student, but it was so profound and it applies here. He said, it's, it's about the lost sparks. So the creator kind of hides these 
sparks, like they sprinkle down from the sky, from our soul. And part of the experience of human life is to discover these lost sparks that we have, mm. these, these gifts that we have to share, these lost sparks, these lessons, these, these, these miracles. And he can't, if, if the lost sparks were floating in the light, when things are great, daytime, we can't see. We can't see sparks when there's light on it. Right? Mm. He hides the lost sparks in the darkness. darkness. Everything, I say he, mm. it, the creator, uh, without gender, obviously, um, <laughs> transcending gender. But it's so beautiful because it's so true. We got to go through the darkness. There's so much to be discovered and found in the darkness. And the darkness, the everything that we are witnessing and experiencing as a collective and the world today is so much darkness, but there, all these sparks are waking up. The darkness is allowing people to hook a spark and go, oh, wait a second, and start to question, start to seek. So the darkness has its purpose, cancer has its purpose, and there is a spark in there. There's a lost spark of your soul that is trying to be revealed to you. I yeah. love that. It resonated so deeply, and I'm like, oh my God, the lost sparks. No, I love that. And this is something that um, I think that, you know, when everything is going well in our life, it's hard to make change, right? Because then people are like, well, why are you blowing up everything if everything's kind of going okay? And why would we if we're like happy? You know? Right. Yeah. But most of us, even when things are happy, we know there are things that need to change. But when you have a crisis like illness or cancer, it's like, you can start to see those little sparks in the darkness that need to change and you're able to see them more clearly. And the, the question is, are you gonna follow it? But I would say that cancer is an opportunity. Like I always would tell my patients, and this was even when I was in my Western treatment, that if you wanna make a change, now's the time because no one's going to question you making big life changes if you're dealing mm. with cancer and you're like this just really changed my life and my perspective and i don't want to do that job anymore or this relationship's not right for me and so i always would tell people use this opportunity because when everything's kind of going okay it's hard to see those little lights and then take big steps to change but i think that when you have this crack like cancer provides it's it's that opportunity to step through and say you know what some things have to change mm -hmm. and you know this you is permission permission yeah. exactly so sometimes it was you know a, the perfect circumstance although painful and terrifying to give you permission to realign mm -hmm. to your mission to re to re remission um so cool I mean, I could talk to you for hours, and we could, and we'll have you back with more inspiring, miraculous stories. Um, because you're so new, and but like mm. we're so aligned. I even write the, you know, crisis and the two Chinese characters in my book. Yeah. So, um, so aligned. Where can people find you? And we need more of you. Mm. We need more of you to work with people. I, we've got to like. I hope you have a course to teach other people to do what you do. But tell us where we can find you. Sure. So my website is katydeming.com and I also have a podcast called Born to Heal. And on the podcast, I share my story of leaving Western medicine and then stepping into this new space. And I invite experts on to share the things that I wish I had learned in medical school and to bring the listeners on a journey with me because I'm learning like I'm a student now I've always been a student but definitely in a new space and so it's been fun to explore and learn and that's where people can hear more from me awesome very cool and do you work um so you you can be a coach you can be hired as a coach like what do you offer yeah so i basically have a virtual practice and i see people in consultation and then if it's a right fit then i work with people on an ongoing basis to support them either through active treatment or doing kind of root cause looking for what are the things that contributed what things in their life need to shift and i walk them through a process of detoxifying and realigning and, and getting themselves balanced so that their body's in an optimal healing position. And what, sorry, I've got more questions now. What, what blood, do you guide people through blood tests that they should take to get you the data that you need to make some initial 
Yeah, so what's interesting is my approach has been much more of an integrative approach than like a functional medicine with lots of testing. Um, I So currently I'm not doing a lot of testing in my practice, but I think that I'm open to it evolving and shifting and I think that it will. But what's interesting is a lot of the things that I do are safe regardless of what people are dealing with and that I think there's a lot that we can do with the body without necessarily having to do a ton of testing. And I, when I first left, I explored like, should I do functional medicine? Should I do this? And I intentionally didn't do any of those trainings because I felt like in some ways is a little bit more of the same, just a different path. And so my, my approach is much more intuitive and um, more of guidance and leading people rather than like true testing. Now we do use testing that they have, right? And some, some testing I do like MTFR testing to you know see if there's um, things that influence w- what they need from a nutritional standpoint. But for the most part, um, most of it is, you know, it's, it's integrative and, and less of like a functional approach. Yeah, based on your background and your knowledge of Mm -hmm. conventional treatments and cancer um that's so great and then with this new consciousness that we you you downloaded during your shared death experience so what an amazing story it's so such an honor to meet you thank you for sharing here Mm -hmm. and best of luck with with all you're doing thank you it's my pleasure to be here it's really nice to meet you Thank you for listening to the Heal with Kelly podcast. Be sure to tune in every Thursday for more empowering wisdom and inspiring healing stories. And make sure you hit the follow button on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts so you don't miss that one episode that holds the answer you've been searching for. Oh, and if you found this episode inspiring, please rate, review, and share Heal with Kelly so that we can grow our audience and reach more people. We truly appreciate it. Lots of love.